Hi, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Great. Glad to have you. And I know Nana's working through first, but um, we have time until we hear from Nana. So we're going to get started here today. Um, we're very excited to be back. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we are talking about challenging the system from the ground up, using state and local pressure to end immigrant detention. Um, my name is Ellen Miller, and I am the pro bono manager at the National Immigrant Justice Center. We're super excited to have you. Mary Meg, our executive director, could not join us today, um, but sends a, a warm welcome to you all, and thanks you also for joining us. Um, so today we're going to talk about the critical efforts that our local communities are taking to fight against U.S. immigration detention machine with our neighbors and partners in Illinois, Virginia, Washington, and California, and other states, um, we are strategically organizing and pushing our democratic system to reject double punishment and to act with dignity for immigrants and immigrant families. If you were here in April, um, you know, if you joined us in April, you might be um, thinking that we already talked about this, but we have some really exciting updates. And so we wanted to um, share those with you and provide some new information and potentially ways that you can get involved as well. Today, I'm also excited to say that we are celebrating our one year of policy corners. Um, so we started these um, presentations and ways to engage with the community um, just a year ago. So if you've been here before and you're a veteran to the policy corner, drop us a note in the chat. Um, we're so grateful to see that people come back and continue, um, you know, to maintain themselves informed and um, get involved in this way. So for those of you that have not joined us before, though, or might not have joined us for a while, um, I'm just going to give a very brief overview of the National Immigrant Justice Center. So we are a part of the Heartland Alliance, which is based largely in Chicago. Um, we have five offices across the United States, including our largest in Chicago, like I mentioned, um, two in Indiana. We have a growing presence in Washington, D.C., also in San Diego. Um, we have an integral service model um, that combines, um, excuse me, combines federal impact litigation, national and local advocacy and education, and legal services to ensure that our immigration system um, provides a fair day in court and is a just system overall. We can only provide these services with a wonderful network of pro bono attorneys and volunteers, and we're over 2,000 strong right now. So we're very excited to be here um, and that you can join us. Before we move forward, I understand that there might be some technical difficulties with audio. Honestly, if you're having some issues, I would say, you know, hang up the call and join us again. Um, kind of that, the old way of doing it is the safest, I think, the easiest. Um, we want to make sure you're here. But also know that this presentation is being recorded, um, and we will post it on our website um, within the next couple of days. Um, everybody is on mute, but we will have a very active chat. I, this is one thing I love about these presentations, is how active the chat is and how we're able to communicate even during these remote times still. Um, so the agenda for today's presentation, um, we're going to talk about overall dismantling the immigration detention system. So some of the state by state efforts, the efforts on the ground going up. We're going to start with um, some wonderful presentations by my colleagues. So Jesse Friends Blau from our DC office will be joining us to give us a, a, an overview to start us off. And then Julian Lasarde um, from Chicago here, along with Amanda Varela. Um, one of our wonderful organizers from our partner um, at ICER he is also joining us to talk about the exciting new updates that we have for the Illinois Way Forward. We'll then hear from Jesse again about um, efforts in other states that are going on to halt the expansion of immigration detention. And then finally, Nana Gupta, who is our Associate Director of Policy, will tell us about how all of these local efforts are really influencing the policy, the federal policy agenda and kind of activities that are happening. And finally, last but not least, of course, like always, we'll talk about what you can do to get or to stay involved and um, have uh, ample time for questions and answers. So before we move on to the content, um, 
if you haven't dropped in the chat yet that you've been here before, um, what we have a question for you today is, um, what, what is the President Biden's budget for ICE or for immigration detention beds? Just take a guess. You know, you can you can Google it if you want and put be all smart and put it in the chat. But um, there is a chat function down here, and just drop in. What do you think is President Biden's budget for ICE beds? Do we have any guesses there? Or and or if you have an idea of what Congress is proposing for ICE detention beds, um, is another option. So let's see what's coming in here. Let me see. Let me get to these these comments um, and kind of. What is okay? So I hear about 50 million. Somebody doesn't remember. Um, Alyssa says doesn't remember, but it's an increase. Yeah, Alyssa, I think it keeps going up, but we'll hear about that in a minute. Um, Harriet saying 40,000 beds. Oh, Connie, we agree. Yes, too much. <laughs> That's why we're here, Connie. Um, exactly. So President Biden, what's his budget or how many beds are we supporting? or you know, is is our taxpayers paying for um, for immigrant detention? Um, to answer that question and to provide more information, I'm now going to turn it over to my wonderful colleague Jesse, who is going to give us an overview um, of what we're going to talk about today. Jesse. Thanks so much, Ellen. Um, and everyone. Uh, for being here. So I'll give a little bit of um, context of what we're seeing at the federal level uh, on immigration detention. Um, and so first to put it in a bit of context, um, so the Biden-Harris administration uh, made quite a lot of very concrete commitments on the issue of immigration detention, uh, spanning from ending private detention, reducing the use of detention generally, and closing facilities where conditions were deficient. Uh, yet, what we're seeing is uh, that ICE detention numbers have really grown at an alarming rate under this administration. In the first six months, the administration has really stunned experts and advocates by ramping up the use of ICE detention by more than 80 percent. Um, ICE is currently detaining more than 27,000 people, uh, a really uh, drastic increase from the approximately 15,000 people who were held at the end of uh, the Trump administration. This uh, also includes a really sharp increase in the unnecessary detention of asylum seekers. Um, if this continues apace, um, the administration is going to quickly surpass the average detention numbers of the Obama era. Uh, these numbers really operationalized the deportations uh, of millions of people. And so this is a big uh, kind of warning, uh, alarm call. And um, of also serious concern, uh, President Biden's budget proposal includes funding for ICE to detain more than 32,000 adults in detention centers. So I think a lot of the answers there um, were quite close. That is um, $2.8 billion uh, uh, for immigration detention in the president's budget. And then on the congressional side, um, very uh, also with a lot of alarm. The, um, uh, on the House side, the House of Representatives, um, their initial bill for the appropriations um, would give ICE uh, 2.4 billion uh, for over 28,000 beds. So on both sides, um, it is quite alarming what's happening in terms of the broader scale um, with regards to immigration detention. Um, and but now I'll turn it over to uh, my colleague Julian Mazalde to speak a bit about what's going on at the local level uh, in Illinois. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, hi, everybody. Again, Julian Mazalde with uh, the Chicago office of uh, National Immigrant Justice Center. Thank you so much to all of you for being here and for your interest in this issue and everything that we do as an organization. Um, so I just wanted to walk through uh, a couple of things. A lot, a lot of exciting things have happened. Um, over the last couple of months here in Illinois, it, specifically in Springfield uh, during the Illinois le legislative session, which ended at the end of May. Um, and so uh, NIGC, in partnership with many different organizations across the state of Illinois, um, however, a lot of them uh, un being encompassed under uh, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights as member organizations, and we'll, as uh, 
as I mentioned, we'll hear from uh, one of their organizers, Amanda, in a bit. Um, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, some victories that we had this year, specifically in regards to the Illinois Way Forward Act, which was a piece of legislation that uh, this coalition of organizations has been working on for quite a long time. And so this is essentially a, a bill that uh, the intent was to try to strengthen and fortify the, uh, the bill as known as the Illinois Trust Act, which was passed in 2017 and signed into law in 2017. So it's been in effect for, for quite a while at this point, uh, just about four years. Um, and what we've seen as an organization and, and other partner organizations is that unfortunately law enforcement agents, some law enforcement agencies across the state um, have um, made attempts uh, at one point or another to, to just sort of circumvent some of the, some of the uh, uh, mechanisms within the Illinois Trust Act to provide uh, uh, safety and sanctuary for individuals here in Illinois uh, and to allow individuals to feel comfortable, particularly going to law enforcement if there is a need to do that. Um, and that's essentially sort of what we're trying to do here with this bill is one, hold law enforcement uh, agencies accountable across the state to follow existing state laws when it comes to limiting police collaboration uh, and immigration enforcement actions, especially. So there was a, a sort of blurring of that line uh, despite having the Illinois Trust Act in place. Um, and, and there's a couple of other provisions that are a part of this as well, which is, um, which is uh, perhaps one of the more contentious ones, which was phasing the phasing out of adult immigrant uh, detention contracts across the state of Illinois, starting uh, on January 1st of next year, 2022. Uh, at the moment, there are three different counties across the state that have um, that have contracts uh, to detain uh, uh, adult immigrants, uh, one being in McHenry County, the other Kankakee County, and then the other being Pulaski County, which is at the far southern tip of, of Illinois. Um, and so those contracts now are set to phase out uh, as, of the, as of the beginning of next year. Um, and besides, the, besides those, those two portions, um, one part that is also very important to MIJC is uh, strengthening what's known as uh, some provisions under the Voices Act, which was passed in 2018, which is focused on uh, providing recourse uh, for victims of qualifying crimes to obtain uh, what are known as U visa certification. So if you've been a, a victim of a crime such as domestic violence or human trafficking, other quite heinous crimes, unfortunately, you are actually, uh, as an immigrant, uh, potentially able to obtain what's known as a U visa, which could eventually put you on a pathway to, to US citizenship. Um, and so there's some strengthening, some language that we were able to insert into this bill, which is also going to do that. We're really excited about that. Um, but in all, what does this do, right? Who does it impact? And as an AJC, as partner organizations, the way we view this is essentially this bill impacts all Illinois residents, right? As it's going to hopefully reduce the fear that immigrants feel, um, not only immigrants themselves, but them and their family members. As we know, they're often um, a large portion of the immigrant community lives in mixed status families, those who have different immigration statuses here in the country. Uh, and again, hopefully being able to feel more comfortable going to law enforcement if and when necessary to do so, if they've been the victim of a crime, if they um, have any, any other emergency need. Um, but also we feel that government agencies are going to be able to benefit by having clearer guidelines regarding their ability to engage with, the, with immigration agencies uh, on immigration related enforcement actions in, in particular. So um, one of the uh, uh, unfortunate talking points or one of the talking points that we wanted to really dispel is that uh, this bill in no way uh, stops ICE from um, operating in the state of Illinois. It simply puts in guardrails that we hope are going to keep our immigrant communities across the state of Illinois as safe as possible um, from unjust de detention and, uh, and possible uh, being possibly being put on a path to deportation. Um, so uh, essentially this timeline, what we're at right now is the bill is currently awaiting the governor's signature. Uh, and so by state law, the governor has 60 days to act on the bill once it reaches his desk. And so that has already occurred. Um, and so the, the, the clock is ticking. Um, thankfully, uh, we had some great news last week, uh, which I know I mean, they could speak about it in more detail, but the governor did attend uh, a, a rally organized by our uh, friends and colleagues at ICER uh, last Thursday, where he announced publicly that he uh, has every intention to sign the Illinois Way Forward Act into law uh, in the coming weeks. So I believe he has until about mid-August technically to do so. Uh, and so I think those negotiations are continuing to make sure that we find a a date and a, and a suitable date and a suitable location to, to do that and to celebrate um, this momentous victory. Um, and so I want to also just talk a little bit, I know I'm running out of time, but if you could just switch to slide number two. Um, so there's, besides this uh, giant victory that which was won with the Illinois Forward, there are a couple of other pieces of legislation that uh, I, I thankfully had the, the good fortune to be a part of. The first being this, uh, this bill, which is uh, focused on uh, special immigrant juvenile status 
um, essentially what we see here, age extension. So this is a, a something that NIJC works with a lot, and it's individuals that are uh, currently up, only up to the age of 18, but in the immigrants, uh, youth, and young adults that have been the victims of uh, uh, abuse, abandonment, and neglect. Uh, and we want to make and um, this essentially uh, allows these individuals um, to seek what's known as a, a predicate order um, from a state court, which they then have to take uh, to USCIS at the federal level. Uh, and again, this would potentially put them on a path to sit it to uh, re residency, then hopefully to citizenship as well. Um, the federal guidelines allow for individuals up to the age of 21 to seek um, uh, these uh, these uh, uh, predicate orders. Unfortunately, here in the state of Illinois, right now we're only allowed up to the age of 18, and so this bill now extends that to the age of 21. So we are now fully hope once the governor signs it, we're going to be fully in compliance with federal with federal guidelines regarding SIJS and the ability for individuals um, to get uh, to seek a predicate order from a suitable state court here in Illinois that take that to USCIS as a part of their their uh, the process to seek this um, uh, this visa. And so we're really excited about that because NIJC does work with individuals who um, certainly are under the age, age of 18, but uh, unfortunately some, in some cases where individuals are maybe 17 or about to turn 18 and are uh, in fear of perhaps uh, aging out essentially of the ability here in Illinois to seek an SIJS predicate order. Now we'll be able to do that up to the age of 21 once the governor signs the bill. And again, that's another bill that we have every, uh, uh, a bit of confidence that the governor is going to sign it based on conversations that we've had with the uh, legislative sponsors of, of the bill and we're really excited about that as well. Um, and besides that, uh, I'll briefly just give a uh, round of applause to our colleagues uh, at the Resurrection Project and the Illinois Business Immigration Coalition that led uh, on House Bill 2790, which is uh, essentially focused on uh, working with um, the public defender's offices across the state of Illinois. Uh, to ensure that non-citizens will be uh, able to be uh, represented by public defenders offices. Um, and right now, the bill only uh, allows for counties that have uh, over a population of 3 million, which essentially is just Cook County here in Illinois. But we know that that is still the location with the highest number of, of, um, of immigrants uh, per county in, in the state. So we're really excited about that bill and kudos to them. And then also one of our, our colleagues on, on uh, the Heartland Alliance side, uh, really worked quite um, hard on this VTCC program extension, which essentially provides um, uh, medical, food, and cash assistance to immigrant survivors of human trafficking, torture, and other serious crimes um, while they go through their visa processing phase. And, and that is just life-saving uh, 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 needs that are met, that will be able to be met by the state indefinitely now because uh, we were in, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, it was, there was a possibility that this program and the funding for it uh, would be phased out as of June of next year. Now that is not the case. Uh, so that will continue moving forward. And so we're really excited about that and grateful for their, uh, for their work uh, on this very important issue. Um, and so with that, I uh, will turn it over to my colleague, uh, Amanda Varela from uh, Illinois Coalition for Immigrant Refugee Rights. Uh, Amanda is our, as you see, our state level organizer for ICER and did an amazing job. And I'll just kick it over to you to walk us through what you did, Amanda, working with our colleagues and your colleagues um, from the member orgs of ISO. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Julian. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Varela. Uh, as I was saying, uh, state level organizer at ICER, uh, pronouns are she hears. Um, so, ICER, the Illinois Coalition for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, uh, is a statewide coalition of immigrant and refugee serving uh, community organizations throughout the state. Uh, we're a mix of our members are a mix of nonprofits uh, that do service uh, and base building and organizing organizations. Um, so as Julian was kind of talking about earlier, um, Illinois Forward is the result of many years of organizing in our communities, right? So this huge win uh, really started years ago. Um, and, and one of the key moments was passing the Trust Act in 2017. So the Trust Act started off as a really big bill, right? Um, that had to be negotiated down. And so since 2017, um, every legislative session, we've gone back for other pieces of the bill. Um, and so Illinois Forward uh, was the last piece of this. So super exciting kind of like to get us towards that vision of what we originally had with the Trust Act, um, right? And so kind of big picture how Illinois Forward and all of this legislation fits into ICER's vision, ICER members' vision of like what we're working towards is that, you know, ICER and our members are working towards a vision and a world where ICE doesn't exist, where we are, you know, where we can say, where we can abolish ICE. 
And so um, the way that we can do that here in our state level work is abolishing ICE in the state. And so um, what that means for us, I know that sounds kind of like a big endeavor. What that means for us is really like reducing the resources that ICE has to operate, right? So we reduce the resources that ICE has to detain people, to separate families, to terrorize our communities. We're cutting them off from the resources and information sharing with police. We're cutting them off from using jails as detention centers, right? We're cutting them off wherever we can and making it as hard as possible for them to do their job. And so that's where uh, Illinois Way Forward and this other type of legislation um, comes into play, right? And so um, how did we kind of get to this victory? And it's, it's really um, in the power of our coalition. Our power is in our membership and in our coalition. So we had a really strong, you know, what we call inside and outside game strategy, right? Where we had a strong team of legislators, legislator allies, our sponsors um, and others on the inside who, um, you know, were our allies to us, but they are also accountable to our membership and to our base. So they know that we're moving with people power. They know that they're moving, that we are moving um, with folks that they're accountable to, to people in their district, to voters, to their community, that, you know, if we don't come through for this, they do have, you know, they're accountable to a community and they'd have to answer to them, right? Um, and so as most things in the past, you know, year and a half, um, our work has been mostly virtual. So in the absence of Springfield Advocacy Days, where we would usually bring hundreds of people, you know, to the Capitol, um, have tons of meetings all in one day, get our commitments and work our roll call, um, our members were just setting up meetings after meetings after meetings, right, and trying to get these conversations with our legislators. Um, however, of course, as it became crunch time the last few weeks, it's harder and harder to get this time with legislators. So we really just kind of, you know, used every avenue possible to just, you know, be uh, in their face about Illinois Way Forward, right? So we ran phone banks, blasted uh, offices with, with phone calls, um, you know, how are you going to vote? Where, you know, are you going to take this vote, et cetera? Uh, we requested meetings, uh, again, worked an inside game with our legislative allies, as well as an on the ground team in Springfield. Um, and, you know, we also had banner drops, local actions. We joined um, local campaigns shutting down, you know, uh, that were working to shut down their own detention centers. Um, and more, right? And so some of the pictures here kind of show that. So we had a banner drop um, action. Uh, we see uh, Lisa Hernandez, you know, with our sign there. Um, really, like we had some folks, some legislators that were really powerful allies and uh, working hard on the inside, right? And of course, we have this uh, a Zoom screenshot, which I know we're all familiar with by now. Um, I think that one was taken from uh, when it passed. Um, in the in the house um so we were all celebrating and having a good time there so um uh yeah in the absence right of of being physically uh together we've still found time to and found ways to engage community and make sure that we were making time to celebrate um and so as far as next steps um as julian mentioned um the governor has publicly committed to signing illinois Way forward um and we're working to to plan a celebration and a signing ceremony um, and then the work continues because we, um, we're going to pivot to a free them all campaign. So um, instead of right folks, detainees, people being transferred out of state and remaining detained, we're going to be fighting for them to be um, released, right? Released to their communities and released to their families. Um, so just uh, really quickly, uh, as kind of a, a, a broad uh, view of like how we were able to win this, uh, really the takeaway is um, people power, of course, right? And so being strategic about that along with an inside game. So um, I know we'll be uh, taking some questions on this later, so I'm happy to answer questions um, when they come up. But um, yeah, thank you all. Um, not sure who I'm passing it to, but I'll uh, let you all go. Thanks so much, Amanda. That was really terrific to hear from you and Julian about the incredibly important um, work there in Chicago. Um, so I'm Jess Franslow again, um, jumping in to talk a bit about um, how NIJC's DC office really builds uh, on a lot of the great work that, that Julian does in Chicago um, with partners uh, like Amanda and, and Iser. Um, and we use a lot of their work to really strengthen our federal advocacy work and support campaigns um, out in this area as well. Um, we do a lot of work blending the legal representation 
work happening there in Chicago also with policy advocacy. Um, we incorporate stories and, and develop resources in support of national campaigns to halt immigration expansion and phase out detention. Um, and uh, take a lot of lessons learned from NIJC's Illinois-based advocacy work, um, as uh, Amanda and, and Julian have been discussing, and use that to support campaigns in the DMV area. I'll discuss a bit of some of the latest state-level efforts to end immigration detention, uh, some of the challenges to the laws that have passed in different states, such as Maryland, California, and Washington State, um, and why these efforts are so important in the broader context of defending the rights of immigrants um, and um, uh, resisting the, the uh, expansion of immigration detention. Um, so uh, first, um, uh, as a bit of an illustration of some of the work that NIJC does to document systemic abuses in ICE detention, um, which is really illustrative of why these campaigns to end detention are so important. Uh, this is one recent um, uh, complaint that we filed. So this is a um, complaint that we filed with the Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties um, with declarations from NIJC clients, people detained in an Indiana jail uh, for uh, in ICE detention that provides information on the abusive conditions and really charges that ICE is continuing to put lives at risk. Um, they are detaining people in close quarters still, social distancing is still largely impossible. They're withholding information regarding how people in custody can obtain COVID testing. Um, COVID is still uh, a major issue in, in ICE detention. Um, it's still spreading at a very alarming rate. Um, and so the both of the individuals featured um, who provided declarations in this complaint uh, end up ended up being released after NIJC attorneys provided legal representation and members of Congress weighed in to help advocate for their release. Um, another campaign uh, that NIJC has been supportive of out here in, in the uh, DMV area, so in Virginia, um, which really shows why um, states and counties uh, have been increasingly taking measures into their own hands and, and working to pass laws to end ICE detention in their in their uh, backyards, um, in part because this is important to prevent new ICE detention agreements, uh, new contracts from popping up. Um, and as we saw in the case of, of Virginia, um, we worked with a lot of community groups in, in the DMV area out here in Virginia and Maryland and DC, to really express outrage that ICE quietly entered into this new contract uh, in February that allows for the long-term detention of migrant teenagers um, in, in this facility in Winchester, Virginia. The contract was signed just a month into the Biden administration. Um, it allows ICE to continue this practice of holding migrant youth, uh, which is a practice that really flies in the face of commitments made by the administration to protect migrant youth and, and reflects really um, ugly vilification of migrant children that was common during the that was common during the Trump administration. Um, we led a letter um, calling for the urgent release of any youth from ICE detention and and ending these these type of agreements. Um, and so another um, campaign in, in another state out here. So in Maryland, we have been involved in um, supporting legislative efforts. Um, so in the next slide where we discuss a bit about the legislation that um, passed in Maryland to end detention in March of this year, and to discuss some of the, the challenges that we've seen um, in, in those efforts. So the uh, bad news is the governor of Maryland uh, vetoed that, that bill. And so now the in the next legislative session, there will be a big effort to try to get the legislature to override the veto. Um, this is also an illustrative case of why these legislative efforts at the state level and local level are really important to stop new contracts before they uh, go into place. As we saw in Maryland, ICE also signed a contract um, to detain people in Dorchester County, Maryland, in February, also in February of this year, uh, just as the state legislature was working 
the FASA bill to end those agreements. Um, so um, we're working with with the groups, um, local groups, to to support that effort uh, in Maryland that that continues to go forward. Um, another example. So um, uh, Washington State. Um, this case really kind of illustrates how um, one of the big challenges, of course, that that groups face, that communities face when trying to end detention in their backyards um, is when companies weigh in. So the private prison companies that profit from ICE detention um, have often tried to maneuver to circumvent state laws when they do pass. And in some instances, ICE has agreed to sign long-term contracts um, just as states are in the process uh, or in instances where they have passed such laws to try to ban detention. So um, we saw in the case of Washington State, in the first weeks uh, of the current administration, ICE uh, modified its contract with GEO Group, the private prison company, um, to extend uh, its period of performance for the contract for the facility in Tacoma, Washington, um, in an apparent effort to really sidestep the state legislative efforts that were underway to end private immigration detention in the state. The, the company then uh, sued Washington State um, after they passed the law banning for-profit jails that would, that would force the, the closure of the Tacoma facility. Um, uh, and local community groups, um, such as the organization La Resistencia, has done an enormous work to document the abuses that take place in this detention center in Tacoma. Um, Tacoma, Washington, this detention center is one of the biggest facilities um, in, in the state. It has a capacity to hold over 1,500 people in detention a day. People in that detention center end up there after raids, um, after they're transferred from local law enforcement, and after being transferred from the border region. So they estimate that around 200 people um, each month are transferred to that facility alone. Um, from from the U.S.-Mexico border after being picked up at the border. So that is a bit of an uh, update of what's going on in, in Washington State now. That struggle continues. Um, and now to go on to California, which is uh, somewhat similar. And California is a bit of a... Um, yeah, so California was one of the first states to pass legislation um, and private detention in, in the state. So legislation called AB 32. Um, but in December of 2019, ICE entered into long-term agreements um, worth billions uh, in California just days before that law, AB 32, was set to go into effect. And those included 15-year contracts um, with the company Geo Group and with the company or Civic. Um, and Similar to what happened in Washington, uh, in California, also just days before that law was set to go into effect in January 2020, you, uh, the company Geo Group sued uh, to stop the state from shutting down their, their for-profit detention centers. Um, in October of this year, uh, a San Diego judge largely upheld the, the state's uh, private prison ban, um, but Geo Group and um, federal officials um, from the above administration, this administration, uh, have appealed that decision. And so last month, lawyers um, urged a panel of judges, uh, and this is now in the U.S. and the Ninth Circuit um, Court of Appeals, and so that struggle is also uh, very much ongoing. Um, so lastly, I'll end with just a little bit of a roadmap of where a lot of these contracts um, are, are accessible. So NIGC has a Transparency and Human Rights Project that is the result of um, longstanding uh, Freedom of Information Act litigation to try to get all of the contracts uh, that ICE maintains and all of the modifications to these contracts because they're modified um, at a pretty um, continuous rate and um, post these documents uh, on the website. So you can see a lot of the, the documents um, to help track the, um, the facilities, 
uh, the newer agreements that come into place that ICE has been um, trying to put into place. So um, with that, I will pass it on, um, I believe, to my colleague, Nana, to give uh, a bit more of an overview of the state of play on the, on the federal level uh, on immigration policy. Thanks, Nana. Thanks, Jesse. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Jesse and Ellen said, I'm Nina Gupta. I'm the Associate Director of Policy uh, here at NIJC. And, um, you know, we work out of DC, as Jesse mentioned, um, to lift up um, these different victories that he's just described um, in various states in the effort to dismantle uh, the US immigration system's reliance on detention. So. What we're doing in DC, um, similar to all of these efforts around the country, is to um, you know, pressure and advocate this administration to carry through on its own commitments uh, to dismantling this system. So, you know, we've heard this administration make significant commitments to ending private detention, reducing the use of detention generally, um, and addressing uh, substandard conditions in detention facilities and um, you know, our strong view, knowing the system, is that in order to follow through on those promises and commitments, the administration really has to take significant steps here to dismantle it altogether. Um, so it's not just enough to reform a few facilities or even close a handful of them, that there have to be significant changes. And in doing that advocacy, um, the, the work that's being done in states like California and Washington and Virginia, the places you just heard about, are really important to show the, the administration and the folks that we're advocating with in DC um, how important this is to communities and what it looks like to close facilities. Um, one of the things uh, that we work on when we see these closures is making sure um, that we're advocating at the federal level that closures of ICE facilities have the effects that we want them to. So in other words, one of the things that we see is that when um, you know, a particular facility is closed down because of amazing organizing and local efforts, um, or because the administration makes a decision to close the facility, that instead of seeing releases of individuals who are in detention, we're seeing those folks transferred just to other facilities um, that also have problematic conditions um, and, and that um, create a whole host of other problems. And so one of the areas that we're advocating on is what we refer to as just closures. Um, and that's you know, making sure, again, that closures of any facilities, um, instead of resulting in these kinds of transfers, actually result in the release of folks so that we're seeing decreases in numbers of folks detained rather than increases like we're seeing now. Um, we also want to make sure that ICE and um, even states that are supporting closures understand that when someone is transferred to another facility, they're often losing access to their attorneys who represent them. They're often further distance from their loved ones in the communities where they may have been arrested initially um, by ICE, and that makes things even harder for them. So how do we make sure as we take these important steps toward dismantling the system, of closing specific facilities that we do it in a just and meaningful way um, for the folks who are stuck in this system. Um, and then, you know, we, we have been working at NIJC on our policy team um, to incorporate, um, you know, the victories you've heard about today to give the administration a roadmap for how they can dismantle this system. And that roadmap um, includes, you know, ending contracts with private prison companies to decrease the reliance on um, private detention. 70% of those currently detained are detained in a private facility. Um, and so ending contracts like that is a key part to dismantling the system and is a commitment this administration had made. Um, we also have offered um, proposals for regulations, for new regulations this administration could pass based on existing immigration law um, that would shift reliance away from putting people in custody for civil violations um, and instead addressing those violations without detention or incarceration at all. Um, so you know, we're happy to answer questions about the strategy that we're taking at the federal level, but um, 
just to say that everything you heard about today from Julian and Amanda and Jesse as to what's happening around the country, those victories um, are very much a key strategy um, in the work that's happening in DC. So thanks so much. I think I'm passing it on to Ellen next. Yes, hello, hello. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about how y'all can get involved. I mean, there's been lots of information yet again, and we are actually doing really great on time. So thank you to the presenters for being so concise. Um, if you have any other questions that you'd like to get answered, you know, put them in the chat and we'll have a few minutes to kind of talk through them, some of the details. Um, but in the meantime, we want to make sure that you continue to know how to get or how to stay involved. So, um, like we always mentioned, you know, one way is um, to keep coming back for more information and let us know what's of interest to you. Um, communicate with your representatives. So there's two specific ways that we can do that, um, that we would suggest you do that today. One is um, at NIJC, we have a petition here to cut funding for abuses against immigrants. Oops, sorry about that. Um, we can drop that, uh, I can drop that link in the chat here in just a minute, um, but this is an ongoing um, point that, you know, as you've heard today of how we can push back um, and make sure that our immigrant neighbors and family members are treated with, with dignity. Um, and then ICER also um, has a call to action, so our, our partner Amanda put this up. It's not necessarily dealing directly with detention, but it is an important pass. Um, for, for immigrants, and we're actually going to be talking about it at a future presentation, probably in August or September. So if you want a little bit more information from ICER there, um, it's talking about a pathway to citizenship through budget reconciliation also. So looking at how we're spending our money and doing that with um, intention and being fair. Um, continue to spread the word. If you are an attorney, we have a approximately 40 cases on our list right now that we're looking for um, representation so that we can continue to provide direct legal services to the wonderful clients and then continue to take their stories to these um, legislative and, and, and policy forums so that we know um, what is happening on the ground and best advocate for them. Um, before, Right before we get into the Q&A here, I just wanted to say that um, in August we will have our justice in Java and we'll be looking at the first six months of the Biden administration, kind of what's been going on. Um, where are we still needing to push a little bit harder, where we're, you know, kind of happy seeing some of the things and, and the hope that's coming back to the system. So we hope you can join us there. That information will be posted on our website soon. If you enjoy these presentations or you have some ideas of how they can be better, hold up your device to this QR code right here um, and it'll take you to um, a survey where you can let us know how that goes or how things are going, right? So your feedback really contributes to what we do here um, and how we can best engage with you while we are while we continue to bring, be in a hybrid slash um, remote work. So with that, then um, we are doing really really great on um, some time here. So I'm going to look at let's see here some of the questions. Just give me a second for Heidi. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to actually invite the panelists to come back on the um, on webcam if that's possible. Um, if you could jump back on webcam, and we're going to work through some of these questions here. Um, I know that there were lots of great questions about what happens to immigrants once detention facilities are closed. Um, I do think that you know Jesse, Julian, Amanda, and Nana kind of covered some of those. But if there's additional clarifications that you'd like, um, you know, let us know about that. Otherwise, um, what I would say is, let's see here. Jesse, if you wanna speak a little bit about um, what we're doing with public education and the Detention Watch Network um, and, and how those efforts um, are affecting you know, federal and local advocacy efforts, would you be able to speak on that? Yeah, and um, yeah, so in response to some of the questions about um, ways to engage and get involved. So Detention Watch Network has a really um, amazing campaign that they're working with grassroots organizations, community groups um, across the country. Um, the One of the campaigns they have is um, the First 10 campaign. So there's 10 uh, 
very kind of notorious detention facilities, um, really emblematic facilities that they're calling for uh, for closure uh, to end the contracts and, and shut those down um, as a step uh, in part of the pathway towards phasing out immigration detention altogether. Um, they also are doing a lot of work around just closures. So as, as, as others have, have discussed, so making sure that when a facility is shut down, uh, there aren't people transferred. So it's not just moving from one um, state or one place to another, um, it's closing down and making sure that people are released um, into the community so that they can pursue their immigration case um, free. Uh, so we can share some of those resources that I think will be helpful as well. Great, thank you. Um, I see here too that today we have quite a number of active members from our faith-based communities and our partners. Amanda, would you be able to speak a little bit about how um, ICER or how other community and organizing folks are, are involving and how the faith-based community is, is getting involved in these efforts? Yeah, um, so I think um, there are several like faith-based right um, organizations that are active within our membership, um, and so it's also just important. I think we're, you know, the strength of our coalition is also just in how many different types of communities are represented, and so that includes right like when we think immigrant issues, it's not just right a Latino Latinx issue. Um, it really spans um, different communities, different uh, religious identities, right? So we have um, active members from the Muslim community, the Jewish community, right? Um, from, you know, Christian and Catholic communities as well, um, who are really powerful in, um, you know, activating their, their members. And um, especially within, you know, uh, the, the Jewish community, we have the um, uh, JCUA, um, I think I'm just forgetting, uh, Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, uh, right? And they are really great at activating their base and really tie it to their faith values. Um, and they have those relationships with um, legislators, right? Um, through that wide network of, of their Jewish community, as well as like other, uh, other uh, Jewish organizations, RAC Illinois is another one. Um, and then we have our, you know, um, our partners in, in the Muslim community as well. So really that power comes from just showing like the diversity of, of our coalition um, and how this is something that impacts, you know, just so many different types of communities that share uh, similar um, struggles, right? And share similar oppression um, from, from the immigration system that we see. So, um, yeah, definitely is a is a huge part of our our coalition and our our power building. Thanks, Amanda, and thanks to all of you know our faith based participants that are joining in and, and really um, getting out there with us. So um, I'm gonna kind of go back to that question of well, we're celebrating today that this bill will become a law, and we're excited for that and all the work that went into it. In the interim, though, so Nicole here put out a really great question. Um, will Illinois ICE jails be able to sign long-term contracts with ICE before this Way, Illinois Way Forward Act goes into effect? If and you know, what are some of the ways that we're working um, during the interim? Julian or and or Amanda, do you guys want to jump on that? Uh, well, what I can say is that the the language that's in the thank you for the question, Nicole, uh, and for joining us. Um, the language that's in the bill uh, specifically said, says that whatever the contract is as of January 1st, the cancellation clause or the opt-out clause has to be enacted at that point. So, I mean, I think at this point, it's a pretty much a done deal in terms of knowing that the, the governor's office is, is supportive of it because he announced it publicly. Uh, and it's just a matter of finding the right day and location for him to formally sign the bill, which will happen likely very soon. So I think, um, you know, uh, any of the existing contracts, any any of the, the uh, three counties that have contracts with ICE at the moment can do as they please, I guess, in terms of wanting to negotiate something. But the truth is, is it would really be a fruitless effort because as of right now, um, whatever contract is in place, whether it's the current contract that they have, or if they were to go into some sort of negotiation over the next couple of months, um, that contract then, whether it was a one-year contract, a 10-year contract, by law uh, of Illinois forward 
would have uh, would have to be phased out. So it would really not make much sense for that to occur. And my understanding is that at least one of the jails, I forget, I believe it's McHenry County, um, it has been going month to month for quite a while now. This was, so they don't have a sort of years long contract. They've just been going uh, on a on a rolling basis. So um, you know, again, we don't expect that that's that's going to occur. But at this point, you know, we uh, I think it, it makes sense for all of us who are in support of this bill um, to just keep our eyes open in terms of what may come down. But um, again, thankfully, in, in the coming weeks, we expect some very good uh, very good news from the governor's office as he signs the bill. Great. And I know um, I'm going to throw this next one to Jesse, actually, and I know that you kind of talked about it in the transparency project, but maybe we can talk about it more at a federal level, too. How do we find out about these contracts, you know, and, and how do these kind of conversations and how do we monitor this? Jesse and or Nina? Yeah, one way. So the the transparency um, project that NIJC does tries to get contracts and the modifications, as I mentioned, um, as up to date as possible. But it is a major challenge, and it's a major, um, you know, lack of transparency on the on the part of ICE. Uh, one thing that ICE does, um, they submit requests for for information first uh, on when they are proposing. Uh, an expansion of a facility or, or a new detention facility. So one thing is monitoring those um, those requests for information um, that we also monitor and often publish um, responses to those um, uh, to oppose uh, those proposals. Um, and uh, but um, of course, one of the big issues is that they you know often will engage in these contracts. Um, before there is any real public information available. So in some of those examples that I discussed in Dorchester, Maryland and Winchester, Virginia, um, they were already in negotiations for those facilities um, before we could get information about that. We use a lot of uh, state-based information laws to try to get information also more, more quickly, um, but it's an ongoing challenge. So I, I would um, monitoring our transparency site is definitely a good place. Um, Nana might have more, more ideas there. Okay. Um, I see Nina shaking her head that um, Jesse covered it. So I'm just going to, we're actually going to finish here early today because who doesn't need an extra five minutes in their life? <laughs> um, um, and we've been so thorough with this information and because all of our great partners have a lot of information on their website. So we definitely invite you to check out NAJC's um, website. There's a lot of about, you know, the, the conditions in detention and our efforts across the country and locally in the Chicagoland area um, on, um, you know, dismantling this detention system. ICER has a lot of other um, and a, a lot of resources as well defund hate and the detention watch network um, and a lot of our other partners that you saw on the slides today and that you can access in the presentation there's more information out there so um we'll we'll wrap it up here oh Julian, sorry yeah. yes ellen sorry to interrupt i just no. saw that a question came through i think would be since, since we do have a couple of extra minutes um question came Please, from yeah. rita um yeah. the question is as a part of a small group supportive of immigration rights we are worried that activism on this issue may be weaponized by Republicans, um, i.e. such as uh, language around defund the police. So what is the right language to use to get support of Republican voters um, in the community? Um, I, one of the things I, I found really, and I would please welcome so many experts um, with my colleagues here. One thing I did want to just jump in with is, first, thank you for the question, Rita. And second, um, I know that um, Perhaps one of the most powerful statements that was made on the Illinois House floor during the debate on uh, Illinois Way Forward, as an example, um, was made by a former ICER staff member who is now a, a, a state representative, uh, Dagmara Avelar, who uh, spoke about um, not only her personal experience as an immigrant in this country, um, but um, more so about the fallacy of building, um, of using jails and detention as a, as a, uh, uh, as a way to build our economy, our local economies, you know, to sort of stake your local economy on 
uh, maintaining a, de a detention center, a jail in place, or building a new detention center, right? And sort of often, especially the private detention companies, use that sort of language to say that this is going to be an economic generator for 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 these communities. Um, and there's a report that was um, that was released uh, not that long ago, uh, which spoke to this issue. And I, I would need to try to find it hopefully before we wrap up today, if one of my colleagues has it off the top of their head. But um, that really speaks to this and, and finds at the national level, there's data to show that that's really, um, you know, that's one way to push back, right? We, people want to talk about, well, we need these, these detention centers. We need to detain immigrants because they can be uh, revenue generating um, uh, 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 schemes, for lack of a better term. And uh, there's ample evidence to show that's really not the case. So I just wanted to throw that out there. As, I think one example uh, um, that has been used, I think, quite effectively, and I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in on that question as well. Um, the only other thing I, I could think of, Julian, and, and I will say that, you know, I, we didn't get any Republican votes for this legislation, right? Um, but even for our more conservative Democrats or moderate Democrats that did vote for it, uh, something that we uh, tried, you know, in terms of messaging was like, <clears throat> this will help police to do their job, right? It's gonna help to like, Police should be doing, well, police should be policing, right? And they should be focusing on that. They shouldn't be focusing on um, immigration issues or, or doing the job of immigration officials. So I think that's also kind of a framing that could be used with like more conservative um, legislators or voters or whoever, right, to kind of talk about policing in that way that this is this is for clear guidelines and for them to focus on what they need to focus on. So that's maybe another another angle or framing I would provide as well. Great, and I see here too, Nana, did you wanna jump in? Sure, I can just say a, a few quick things, um, just on the point of the, the fear mongering, <laughs> frankly, that we see around this like notion of public safety. So just one thing to say that I think is important as a zoom out big framing point that I find helpful in the advocacy that, you know, that I engage in is that what we're talking about here, right, is a civil immigration system. Other civil systems we think about are like our tax systems, right? We don't, we're not talking about a criminal legal system. Um, this is a civil system that's relying on incarceration and detention in a really punitive and harsh and extreme manner. Um, and so even if there's some sort of like nervousness to use language like abolish or dismantle um, that feels somehow radical because of some of the pushback we've seen in other spaces, reminding folks that these asks we're making are again in the context of a civil system, that feels important. And then a second, I think just, you know, research and evidence, we have so much of it um, to show that um, a lot of the harsh enforcement policies, including around detention, have absolutely no bearing on increasing public safety and in, in fact, decreased public safety. Um, and so the idea that abolishing certain parts of this system or dismantling detention and releasing folks would undermine public safety is completely belied by significant social science research and data um, that really shows, um, you know, this, there's this phenomenon called the immigrant revitalization perspective. It's a, it's a, you know, social science wonky way of saying that the more immigrants we have in our communities, um, you know, the more vibrant they are across a lot of different social science indicators um, and measures. And so I think it is important in the advocacy we do, um, I would say, to take on that public safety narrative pretty head on because it's just not supported um, by what we know. Um, and we know that you can enforce civil laws without this kind of harsh enforcement and there's no effect decrease on public safety. I love these conversations and I apologize for trying to rush us off here, but I'm so glad we were able to finish this and thank you, Julian, for seeing that. Um, it is 11 o'clock. We want to respect people's time. I'm sorry, it is 1 o'clock um, Central Time, 11 Pacific. Um, and so we do want to respect people's time here. And thank you for joining us. Again, check out those resources. Um, and we will be in touch soon in the next couple of weeks. So thank you to our presenters. And you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for your efforts. Bye-bye.